Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to have you here with us. It's just my wife here uh, joining me today. I think my mother's struggling with her restless leg syndrome, so if I could ask you to pray for her. She's been miserable the last couple of weeks. So this is, as of tomorrow, it's eight weeks of quarantine for Nancy and I and our family. We started a couple of weeks ahead of everybody else, but uh, it's dragging on. And so I hope this finds you well and staying at home and that all your needs are being met. Right here, it's uh, sunny here right now, and I just saw a butterfly fly by, flutter by. So beautiful creation all around us. So we're here to pray, and we're here to read uh, Psalm 20 today. So let's begin with prayer. Kind and merciful Father, I thank you for everyone gathered and for those who are still gathering. I thank you for everyone in our churches, brothers and sisters in Christ, eternal friends in Christ. It's been very difficult being separated from each other. It's been difficult being separated from family. And maybe not so difficult for some to be separated from their jobs. But I thank you for the good work that you're doing in us as a church and in our churches across the United States. And I also thank you for the good work that you're doing in the world right now, even in the midst of this pandemic. Nothing in your economy is ever wasted, Lord. And so, Father, we pray again that whatever your purpose, whatever your will, whatever your intent is in allowing for this pandemic, that that purpose, will, and intent would not return void, that your word would accomplish that for which it has been sent. As states now start looking at getting back to work and reconvening, I pray that you would give the leaders of our states much wisdom in knowing when to release us and when to keep us staying at home. And so, Father, we pray for wisdom for our leadership team as well in our church, that as we start making plans for how we, how we are going to get back together again, how we are going to reconvene, that you would give us great wisdom and discernment and knowledge and spiritual understanding to know when it's too soon to start meeting and that we don't tarry too long either. And I pray that as we start meeting, you would help us to know what that's going to look like. I pray for our leadership across the country, Lord, for President Trump, for Nancy Pelosi, for Mitch McConnell, for our governor, Governor Inslee, for our, our county officials, our city officials. I pray that you would grant them wisdom and knowledge and skill beyond their own understanding, even beyond their own abilities, Lord. Here we are in the middle of an election year, and usually this is a huge political fight right now. And yes, Lord, we know that a lot of this has been politicized. We see it. We hear it. but help us as a nation to lift ourselves or to be lifted actually above our divisions, Lord. And to find unity in the one and only true God in you, Lord. We pray for revival. We pray that there would be a great outpouring of your spirit in the midst of these troubled times upon this nation 
upon our states, upon our cities, upon Bremerton and Silverdale and Port Orchard, Belfair, Allen, Paulsbo, Olala, Sunny Slope, Kingston, Keyport, Bainbridge Island, Seattle, Tacoma, Everett, Olympia, Centralia and, and Chehalis, on Yakima, who's been re really hit hard with this, on Gardnerville in Nevada, and the cities around the world, Lord. We know that from your word, cities tend to breed evil, and yet you love the people within cities just as you love Jerusalem. So we, we call out to you to redeem our nation, to redeem us as a people, and around the nations of the world that you, those winds of revival would come. I've had colleagues tell me or friends tell me that revival can't come now because we're too close to the end. My only question is, is where is that written? I know that the very end, end of days will be a great falling away May you give us spiritual discernment so we know, so that we may know what is truth and what is falsehood, that we may live according to the truth, and that we might never fall away, Lord, that we might never fall away from your grace. So, Lord, in individual people's lives all around this nation and around this world, Please call people by name, Lord. Call people home. Shine the searchlight of the grace and glory of God in the face of Jesus into their hearts that they might know and be persuaded that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God, God clothed in flesh. And because of that, he has the power to save us. And because he, uh, he, he is the Messiah, he has the means to save us. Turn our hearts towards home, Lord. Awaken that eternity in our hearts. And lastly, again, I pray for all the families around the world who have lost loved ones. That you would comfort them. You might be specially present to them, and if they don't know you, I pray that they would come to know you, Lord. We entrust these days and the unfolding of the days of, he uh, of the days ahead. We entrust these days into your hands, into your mercy, into your grace. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're looking at Psalm 20. And I really didn't understand much about the psalm. I read it and I thought, this is a wonderful psalm. And then as I did some study on it, its application is quite different than what I've expected. So let's read it and then we'll go through it verse by verse. Psalm 20, verses 1 through 9. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the na name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. May he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. May he remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offering acceptable. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel. We will sing for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, 
but we have risen and stood upright. Save, O Lord. May the King answer us in the day we call. So we begin with Psalm 20, verse 1. We're told within the text that it's for the choir director, a Psalm of David, again, instruction to the Levitical, Levitical choir in that day, whatever that meant. And then it says, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. And again, we have the Lord capitalized. So we know that this is the name Yahweh. When the Hebrew people would be reading, when the rabbis and scribes and the chief priests would be reading this, when they would come to the name Yahweh so as not to defame that name, they would read the word Adonai in place of Yahweh so as not to defame this most holy name. And so that kind of picked up into the Greek where they use the word Kyrios. Adonai is Lord in Hebrew. Kyrios is Lord in Greek. So that get, got picked up in the Septuagint, the, the Greek Old Testament, which was the Old Testament or the Hebrew the scriptures. That was actually the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures that was used by Jesus and by the apostles in the New Testament. And so we've kept that convention's convention in our Bibles. There's a few Bibles out there now that are using Yahweh or Jehovah, which is an old transliteration of that. But I, I haven't taken the time to really look at the word Lord here. And so I, I thought we'd just take a little whirlwind tour into this name, Lord. And so we begin with, there it is, Yahweh in the Hebrew. It reads from the right to the left. And so it's Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. We don't really know how to pronounce it because the Hebrew language in its, when it was originally used didn't have any vowels in it. And so the Hebrew people just knew how to supply the vowels. Later on with the Masoretic text, years and years later, this is after Christ, they put in vowel points with what they thought was the correct about, about, how do I say it, the correct pr pronunciation of these, these different words. So we really don't know. We just know that it's four consonants, Y-H-W-H. Sometimes it's called the tetragrammaton, tetra from four, and grammaton from letters, so the four letters. And we'll see in Exodus here that it's considered the most holy name of God. So in Exodus chapter 3, verses 12 and 15, this is where we really encounter this name for the first time with the depth of meaning that it has. And he, and he said, and this is God speaking to Moses. Moses has found God in the desert at the burning bush. God is talking to him. And Moses is arguing with God on why he can't be a candidate to go and deliver the people of Israel. And it's the middle, in the middle of this argument that Moses is having with God. And God said, certainly I will be with you and this shall be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. So we know that that was that holy mountain where Moses received the Ten Commandments, where the people had that great party worshiping a golden calf because they thought Moses was lost. It's that mountain. And God says, you'll know that I'm with you because... When you come out of Egypt, you'll return to this very place, to this very mountain. Then Moses said to God, and here he goes arguing again, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? He's saying, Look, I don't know your name. I can't do it. He's trying to squirm out of this. Later on, he says, I don't have any voice. And God says to him, Who, who gave you that speech impediment, Moses? I love Moses. He's, he argues with God. He has a lot of chutzpah, I guess it is. God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's his name. I am who I am. And the connotation is, of that is that in God, in his own being, he has eternal life. He has the capacity to live without any need from any outside source. He is life. I am who I am. And it also has to do that he's eternal. He's always been, always will be. I am who I am. 
And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I love that. His name is I am. It's a verb. It's action. It's presence. My Old Testament pre professor, my Hebrew scripture professor, Fred Holmgren, used to say that the connotation or the emphasis on this was God's presence with us. I am who I am, but I am the one who goes before you and comes after you. I am with you. And isn't that the name Emmanuel, God with us? God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, and there it is, Yahweh, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh has sent me to you. And so now we have the great I am, I am who I am, and I am connected with the name Yahweh. And it's thought that Yahweh is the noun form of the verbal form found in the name I am. So these are, by the text in, he, in Exodus, they are put together as one name, I am and Yahweh. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. So God reveals to Moses that this is his forever name. And this is the name by which we remember him for all generations, this name Yahweh. So now what we see is a very surprising thing. We get over to John, and we know that Yahweh, this Y-H-W-H, -H, is associated with the I am. In John 6.35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. I am the bread of life. In those words, Jesus is saying, I am Yahweh. I am who I am. I am that God that you were worshiping, that you worshiped in the, old, in the Hebrew scriptures. I'm he. I've shown up in the flesh. I've touched down on planet Earth. I'm here with you now. I am the bread of life. John 8, 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We'll be able to see in the presence of Jesus. When he's not here, we're blind. But in the presence of Jesus, he gives us spiritual sight. He gives us sight we can see. And again, he says, I am the light of the world. John 8, 58, this is the most surprising one. They asked Jesus, were you before Abraham? And Jesus responds to, these, to this crowd of people from Judea. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now there's nothing after it, just the I am. And in the next verse, if you read in 859, they pick up stones and try to stone Jesus because in their minds, he's committed, committed blasphemy because he's called himself God, this most holy name. Jesus is the great I am. He is Yahweh. Moving on in John, John 10, 7. So Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. Again, saying that he's Yahweh and he's the entrance to the fold. He's the entrance into eternal life. He's the door, no other door. Then in John 10, 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep looking ahead to the cross, looking ahead to that once and for all sacrifice where he will put away sin from the world. I am the good shepherd, also referencing Psalm 23, that he is that shepherd described in Psalm 23. And now he's on the planet walking amid, amongst us. I am the good shepherd. Again, in John 11, 25 and 26, speaking to Martha, after he's tarried for four days, having gotten word from them that Lazarus is sick and he waited till Lazarus died and now he comes. 
Lazarus has been in the grave for four days, which is all the way dead, which would have been the point at which they believe that decomposition, well, they would have known that decomposition had already started in that hot climate. So that when they, later on in the story, when Jesus asked them to roll away the stone, they said, we can't, Lord, think of the stench. It, it'll be horrible. And Jesus says to Martha, when she comes running out to him and meets him, falls at his feet and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus said these most poignant words to him or to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And it's not just believing in Jesus as the Messiah, and it's not just believing in Jesus as the Son of God, that he is Yahweh in the flesh. But it's saying, do you believe that for those who believe in me, they have been given eternal life. It's something for us to believe. I think a lot of us lose security because we get messed up on this one. We come in understanding that the gift is eternal life and then we're told, well, you can't really be sure. You got to persevere to the end, whatever it is. John, 1 John 3, uh, 5.13 says, these things I've written to you so that to those who believe that you may know that you have eternal life. John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Already has it the moment you believe and does not come into judgment, but has passed. Perfect tense verb, something that's already happened. And now the eternal benefits has passed from death, eternal death, into life, into eternal life. So if you've entrusted your life to Christ, if you've been persuaded that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, then you've been given eternal life and he asks you this poignant question, do you believe this? Yes, I believe. It gives me great hope in these days, whether by pandemic or by illness. He has given us this tremendous gift of eternal life. Then John 14, 6, these wonderful words, these were the, was the text that I had to preach on for my ordination. When I was preparing for ordination, they gave me a sermon and they gave me the text to preach on. Jesus said to him, to Thomas, to doubting Thomas, I'd rather call him Thomas the realist. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, through Jesus. Think about that. I am the way and the truth and the life. He's the only way to the Father. But through Jesus, you can't get to the Father. He is the truth. There's no truth outside of Jesus. And the life. Again, he is the resurrection and the life. If you have Jesus, you have the eternal life, which was with the Father. Father, and now has been manifested to the apostles and reported to us. Again, I am referencing that Hebrew name that was so hallowed by the Hebrew people that they wouldn't even speak it. And then lastly, in John 15, 1, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. I am the true vine. If you get into John 15, 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, she who abides in me and I in her, she it is that bears much fruit. He it is that bears much fruit when we allow Jesus to be in us and us in him. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus, over and over again, we say that there's seven I am statements. Well, there's the eighth with Abraham. Before Abraham was born, I am. But if you actually do a word search of I am, especially if you can do it in the Greek, you'll find out that Jesus says this over and over again. When the soldiers from the Sanhedrin show up along with a Roman cohort to arrest Jesus, they said, where is Jesus the Messiah? And Jesus says, I am he in the translations. But literally he says, I am. And when he says, I am, they all fall flat on their backs. That should have told them something. 
this is, might not be a good idea. But they go ahead and do it anyway. So that, that name, the Lord, anytime we come across it in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament, we're speaking of Jesus, the good shepherd, Jesus. The Lord here, it's Jesus. May Jesus answer you in the day of trouble. And this psalm, as you read through it, I missed it when I read through it at first, but it's a psalm about going to battle. David is going into battle as the king at, at the head of his troops. And so this is a battle psalm, a battle prayer, a pre-battle prayer, if you will. And even though David wrote it, it's written in third person, in a sense, praying for the king, praying for David as he goes into battle, asking his people to pray for him these words. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. For David, it was a, the trouble of battle coming, the trouble of, of that raging fight coming, and the potentiality that he may lose his life in the battle. So may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. I like that word, trouble there. I remember over in John 16, 33, it says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. I have peace in Jesus, untold, uncommon peace right now. In this world, you will have trouble or tribulation in some translations. It's that picture of the wine press being pressed down. Do you feel like you're being pressed down right now? Do you feel like you have trouble in your life? In this world, you will have trouble. You will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. He didn't say as Christians, we'll be removed from trouble. He, he actually promises us, in this world, you will. It's prophetic. You will have trouble. And don't we know it? In so many ways, financially, relational stress, the shattering of relationships, little food on our table, the loss of jobs, health problems, liver problems, cancer problems, bad back problems, need of hip replacement problems, and the list goes on and on for, for us. Diabetes, COPD, breathing trouble. Every one of us has trouble in our life. As a pastor, one of my roles and one of the, the parts of ministry which strangely gives me joy is to listen to people's troubles, to hear them out, to listen to your woes. We all have trouble. So please never apologize for letting me hear your troubles. But I love this, while we have troubles in this world, Take heart. Take heart. Jesus has overcome the world. I wish he would just do away with all our troubles in a fell swoop, but then we wouldn't learn to trust him. I think trouble is a school of faith. It's a school of trust. So David had prayed or had actually other people pray for him, may the Lord, and for the nation actually, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. So it's really a prayer for David, King David, and the armies as they prepare to go into battle. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the God of Jacob set you securely on high. Being set securely on high would be given a, a, a post on a hilltop where he could see the whole battle, just as Moses was on that hilltop when he lifted up the rod of God, and as long as his arms were lifted and the rod of God was lifted, the battle would be, be going in their favor. As soon as he would get tired and start lowering his arms, the battle would go against them. And so Moses stood until he could no longer hold it up. Then people came along both sides of him, held up his arms for us, that's what we be, need to be doing for each other today, is holding each other up in prayer, holding each other up in, with a listening ear, holding up each other with encouragement that the Lord is with us and he is victorious, that he does not forsake us. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. Jacob was the father of Israel. Later on, he's called Israel. So it's an allusion to that this is the God of the nation of Israel. 
And what we'll find in here that there's a whole series of petitions in these in this psalm. It's really a, a prayer. And so in verses 1 through 5, that section is a section of petition. And so we see right off the bat, may the Lord answer you. That's the first petition in the day of trouble. Isn't this perfect for us, apropos for us right now? In our day of trouble, may he answer us in the trouble we find ourselves in, whether it's pandemic, whether it's COVID-19, or whether it's the daily and weekly and monthly and yearly troubles that we encounter in our own lives. May the Lord answer you. And then the second petition, may God set you securely on high. I shortened it up, but may the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. May you be set above your troubles. May you given a, be given a vantage point or vantage place above your troubles where you can arise above them. And then we move on. It says, may he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. This would have been before the temple was built. Solomon uh, built the temple. David's son, Solomon. So because of this, this is a Psalm of David, the temple hasn't been built yet. There was the, the tent that David uh, construct, constructed or put up to house the Ark of the Covenant. But that word sanctuary is actually the word holiness. May he send you help from his holiness, from his absolute righteousness, his goodness, his holiness, and support you from Zion. So the thought was wherever the Ark of the Covenant was located, there was the presence of God. And the Ark of the Covenant was in Zion. And so this is very covenant language, calling upon their covenant God, who had given them the Ten Commandments and the manna and the rod of Aaron, which was found inside the Ark of the Covenant. David is writing this so that the people would pray for he and his armies that they're going out to battle, that God would be with them. Now, we don't have physical battles as much. Some of us do. But we are all in a spiritual battle, spiritual battle for people's souls, and a spiritual battle, if you're a believer, for your witness. Enemy will do, the enemy, Satan and his demonic angels, his demonic evil spirits, will do anything to soil your witness, to destroy your witness. So we pray that he might send help from his holiness, from his complete and absolute and pure righteousness, and that he might support us from the real Zion, which is heaven itself, the throne room of God, the throne of grace. So here we see another petition. May he send you help and support. You could divide that up in two. I'm not trying to make any uh, distinct distinction here. I was going with the may he, and so we have may the Lord answer you, may God sent, set you securely on high. May he send you help and support. We go on to verse 3. May he remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offerings acceptable. So under the law, they were directed to give all these different kinds of offerings. A meal offering was a, a soothing aroma to God. A burnt offering was often a thanksgiving or a guilt offering. There was different uses of burnt, burnt offerings. We don't know precisely which offering they're talking about here. And then he asks us that word selah, and that means likely to just pause and ponder this. And so before battle, they would make offerings to Yahweh to secure his help in going with them. Well, I think about this. We don't need to be making offerings to secure God's help anymore. And so I, I the fourth petition is, may he remember your offerings. But as I thought about this, we're in a completely new covenant. We're not in the covenant that God made with Israel. We're in the covenant that God made with Jesus, and we are in Jesus. Jesus is our representative. And it was a covenant made for the whole world to anyone who would call out to Jesus, save me, and believe, and believe in him. So I want to just take a moment to look at that we don't need to make offerings because our offering has been made once and for all. So we rest secure. Hebrews 7.26 says this, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, 
speaking of Jesus, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. Jesus, when he ascended to the throne of grace, to the throne of God, he was exalted above the heavens. And then look what it says in verse 27, Hebrews 7, 27, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all. Do you hear that? We read this and we kind of go right over it. This he did once for all when he offered up himself. No further need for sacrifices. The once and for all sacrifice of Jesus put away sin, took care of sin for all time. Does that mean it gives us a license to go out and sin? By no means. When I hear this, I want to draw so close to the one who so loved you and so loved me. And frankly, folks, we don't need a license to sin. We're quite good at it driving without a license. Continuing in Hebrews, Hebrews 9.11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, of those unknowable good things that he's prepared for us, what no ear has heard, what no eye has seen, what no mind has even been able to conceive, those good things. He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, the real one, not the shadow here on this earth, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. And then continuing in verse 12 of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, and not through the blood of goats and calves, that were, that's what we're talking about over here in Psalm 20, verse 3. Not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, through the blood of Yahweh, through the blood of Jesus. He entered the holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption. That idea of redemption is again, as I explained yesterday or on Sunday, is when a benevolent person would go into a slave market, purchase a slave for full price, and then write a certificate of freedom that would set that slave free. No longer a slave at all, a free man, a free woman. And we've been freed by the blood of Christ. We've been freed from religion. We've been freed from death. We've been freed from our sin. We've been freed from the rule of Satan and his power over our lives. And we've been freed unto this wonderful dance, this wonderful love affair with our Lord Jesus Christ and with the Holy Spirit and with God the Father. We love to turn things into religion. We, we love to take this wonderful dance and hamper it, hobble it, if you will, with all of our own rules and commandments and teachings. Do you hear that? He had entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Verse Hebrews 9, 27, going a little bit further in the chapter, and as much as it is appointed for man, men to die once, and after this comes judgment, there's no reincarnation, we die once and that's it, then we face judgment, and it's either the great white throne judgment in the mystery of time, God being outside of time, or the Bema Seat of Christ, which we talked about on Sunday. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, and that's the sins of the whole world we find out, we know, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. Hmm? He'll appear, we'll see him without reference to our sin. He won't even mention it. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I will remember your sins no more. And if he doesn't remember them, why do we keep bringing them back up to him? He will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who we eagerly await him, meaning those who have entrusted their life, who have believed, whose names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you don't receive that full pardon because you didn't believe, then you're left in your sin. But he won't be coming with, refer with reference to that sin. He'll be coming with reference. What did you do with my son Jesus? Did you believe him? Did you take him at his word? Did you take me at my word? Did you receive that free gift of eternal life? 
And then one more in Hebrews 10.10. 10, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What does that mean, once for all? It means that there's no further sacrifice by which sin must be put away. I know Martin Luther beat himself when he was a monk, trying to eradicate the sin from his life. And the more he did that, the more miserable he became, the more aware, acutely aware of his own sin he became, until finally he discovered the gospel of grace in Romans. Do you follow that all of our sin has been put away once for all at the cross of Jesus? How much of your sin was past at the cross of Jesus? Actually, how much of your sin was in the future at the cross of Jesus? All of my sin was, and all of your sin was future. And he put all of your sin and all of my sin away at the cross in the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus. In Colossians, it's, it tells us, having forgiven us all of our sins. And so he offers you not just the partial pardon that you have to keep asking for forgiveness. We do that in order to restore fellowship from our side. That's 1 John 1, 9. Read it in context. That you might have fellowship with us at the beginning of the chapter. We receive the fullness of the pardon. We are at eternal peace with God. Some people have heard me saying, by saying this, that I'm giving people a license to sin. And with Paul, again, I'll say, may it never be. If that's what you're hearing, you've got to listen harder. If that's what you're hearing, there's something wrong in the way you're hearing. Because what it makes me want to do is come and fall at the feet of Jesus. Thank you for bearing my sin. Thank you for bearing all that crap in my life. And taking it away. Never to remember it again. So when we say, in, when we read this in Psalm, that's under the old covenant, under the covenant of Moses. May he remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offerings acceptable. Before battle, we don't need to be making any offering. We need to be remembering the offering of Jesus by which everything was put away. All sin was put away. And we are to now ponder this. Selah. Throughout this afternoon, take time to ponder what Jesus did for you on the cross. What sins are you still hanging on to? What sins am I still hanging on to that we don't need to be hanging on to? In Romans 8, it suggests to us that if we have those sins, we put them to death by the Spirit of God. We don't put them to death by trying harder, by making commitments, recommitments to our commitments, by promising Him, I'll never do that again. That's the worst thing you can do. Guaranteed you'll do it again before the day is over, before the week is over. No, we ask the Holy Spirit to put to death the things that we cannot conquer in our own life, which is just about everything. Well, everything. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Then moving on in our psalm, 20 verse 4, may he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel. And again, I put this into one, one request. May he grant you your heart's desire. What would have been David's heart's desire going into battle? What would have been the people, the army's heart's desire was to have a victory, was to have success, no loss of life, a minimal loss of life, and fulfill all your counsel. It can be also construed as your purpose. So you're going into battle with counsel. You're going into battle with a plan, with a scheme, with a strategy with a purpose and here he's asking the people to pray for them as they go into battle that god might fulfill their heart's desire for victory and he might fu fulfill their plan in going into battle and then we find in verse 5 we will sing for joy over your victory so already before the battle has even begun they're singing for joy over your victory that God is going to bring. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. That's why I have these float, flowing banners behind us today. 
We will set up our banners. They set up banners to celebrate victory. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Here's another now petition, the sixth one. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. So we have this list of petitions leading up to this petition. May the Lord answer you. May God set you securely on high. May he send you help and support in the midst of the battle. May he remember your offerings. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel or purpose. And now may the Lord fulfill all your petitions, which we just prayed. We are in constant battle with the enemy. What wonderful prayer for us to be praying in our battles, whether real in the sense of physical or whether real in the sense of spiritual. They're both real and can be extremely difficult. And notice, may the Lord, may God, may he, may he, may he, may the Lord. And so we have these series of requests. And you could, you could ha have actually nine here, split up three into two, split up five into two. It doesn't matter the number, but there's this, it's a, a psalm of request, a psalm of prayer. And then we get into a different part of the psalm. It, it transitions into a different topic, if you will. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. Now that's confidence, that's trust. I know that the Lord saves his anointed. Who would be the anointed here? The king, King David, but also the people of Israel, the armies of Israel have been anointed for battle. I know that the Lord saves his anointed and we have been anointed by the Holy Spirit. We have been set apart for eternal life. And so we know that the Lord Yahweh, Jesus, saves his anointed, saves those set apart. He will answer him from his holy heaven. He will answer David. He will answer the armies of Israel. He will answer us from his holy heaven. Before it was from his sanctuary, from his holiness in Zion, from that Ark of the Covenant, from Mount Zion. Now it's broadened out to he will answer us from heaven itself with the saving strength of his right hand. When we talk about the right hand of God, we talk about his power, his active arm, his action, if you will. And so now here, David with confidence is asking the people to have confidence in the victory that God has already wrought for them, in the victory that they already have because God is going with them. We already have victory over this pandemic. We already have victory over the things in our life. I already have victory over this cancer, whether by life or by death. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. So we have a confession of trust in the Lord. We have the petition, and then we have a confession of trust. I believe, I know that you're going to answer me, that you've already answered, answered me. We move to Psalm chapter 20, verse 7. Or Psalm 20, verse 7. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. Prior to Solomon becoming king, he warned the Israelites not to put their trust in chariots, in horses, or in masses of gold. That was instructions given to Solomon later on. And what did Solomon do? He amassed, what, 10,000 chariots, I believe. He amassed horses. He amassed wealth. And he was also told not to go after foreign wives. And he had 700 con concubine and 300 wives. I'm sorry. This is the, the wisest man who ever lived, aside from Jesus. He's the wisest human being who's not God. And I think, man, he's not very wise. What about the rest of us then? That doesn't bode too well for us. But we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. So other countries, these, this, this army we're going out against, they boast in their might, in their, in their equipment. If you had a chariot and a horse, you were in that day, that was the most formidable piece of equipment in an army was a chariot and a horse. David and his people, he's not asking them to look to their, the strength of their arm, armor. He's asking them to remember that we will boast in the name of Yahweh, of Elohim, of God. In our battle, we don't look to ourselves. 
It says, put on the full armor of God. And in his strength, stand firm in his strength. Take on the full armor of God. And every one of those pieces of the armor turns out it's Jesus himself. He is our peace. He is our righteousness. He is our truth. He is the gospel. He is our sandals, if you will, of peace prepared for the gospel. He is our peace. He is our all in all. Then Psalm 28, they have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. So those who put their trust in human might, in chariots and horses, they fallen down. But because of our trust in Yahweh, because of our trust in Jesus, we have risen and stood upright. I'm standing upright today in the midst of the trials in my life, not because of my strength, not because of my goodness, not because of my righteousness, but because of the strength of Yahweh, because of the strength of Jesus. He has strengthened me. He strengthens me day by day. He gives me grace, this uncommon, unmerited, undeserved, kind and generous power of God to save and forgive and transform broken and sinful lives forever. We stand upright in his grace. And so this is the results of trusting in the Lord instead of armor and instead of all of our technology. As a church, we have so often trust in, trusted in our technology to build the church. When we actually have the privilege and opportunity to be putting our trust in Yahweh, to be putting our trust in Jesus. And so the results of trusting in the Lord are that we have risen and stood up. We've not been defeated. We've not been struck down in battle. The enemy is coming after me. The enemy is coming after you. Where do you put your trust? Ghostbusters. No, not, not that. I'm sorry. No, we put our trust in Jesus. In him alone. He is our hope. He is our joy. He is our peace. He is our salvation and redemption. He is our righteousness. He is our justification. He is our sanctification. He is our all in all. Then we come to the last verse. Verse 9, save, O Lord. So he's asking that as the king goes into battle, as the armies go into battle against a foreign army, save us, O Lord, deliver us. We, what a wonderful prayer for our circumstances today. Save us, O Lord. In the midst of this pandemic, save us, O Lord. In the midst of all of our troubles, in the world, you will have trouble. But Yahweh, Jesus, has overcome the world. Save, O Lord, may the king answer us in the day we call. So here is, he's asking for timing of the answer. Sometimes we ask and we think, well, he'll get around to it sometime. But it probably won't be today. Davis is, David is saying with boldness, I want to hear your answer today. Because we're going into battle today. I don't, I don't want to hear your answer tomorrow or next week. May the king, and he's not talking about King David here. He's talking about the eternal king, his descendant, Jesus, ascended on the throne. May the king answer us in the day we call, in that very day. In this very day, as we call on you, Lord, may you hear our prayers. There's a new thing for your prayer life, a new request, a new petition. So again, this is another petition. So now we have at least seven, possibly nine petitions in this psalm. May the Lord answer you. May the Lord, and I'm going to translate it to us. May the Lord answer us. May God set us securely on high. May, may he send us help and strength. May, he, may we remember the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. May he grant us our heart's desire and fulfill all of our purpose as we face the battles of life. May the Lord fulfill all of our petitions, and may the King, King Jesus, answer us 
in the day we call. So this is a psalm to take out. Brush it off. Ponder it. Read through it. Meditate on it. Read it. Let it roll through your mind over and over again, the phrases, the words. Christian meditation is never emptying your mind. Christian meditation is always meditating on Scripture, meditating on God in and through Scripture. And again, you see, may, 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 may. May the Lord, may God, may God, may he, may he, may he, may the Lord, may the King. I can count seven there, but there's likely eight or nine. The psalm of prayer that lends it so well to our battles, to our troubles, to the pandemic. Take this out and pray it. As one body, let's pray it together. Well, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate the time you, you spend in listening and watching. For those of you also who are watching later on YouTube, I very much appreciate the time you take out of your day to watch and listen. I hope this has enriched you. What wonderful, what a wonderful prayer we can pray for those of us who are going into very real battles, for those of us who are going into the battles of the troubles of this world, whether illness or financial trouble or whatever that battle is. What apropos pray, prayers for us to pray. Let's close with prayer. Father, I just thank you for all these petitions that David has offered up, that David has actually requested his people to pray for them as they go into battle. And so, Father, today we pray that you would answer us in this day of trouble when we are overwhelmed with the COVID-19 pandemic. May the name, may your name, set us securely on high above our troubles. May he send us help and support from the throne of grace. Thank you for the sacrifice that you made, the once and for all sacrifice that you made for us. Let us ponder this sacrifice throughout the day and its implications for our lives. May, he, may you grant us our heart's desire, Lord, and may you fulfill not our counsel, but your counsel, Lord, your purpose in our lives. We will sing for joy over the victory that you have already given us and over the victories yet to come. And in the name of our God, we will set up banners. We will celebrate. We will shout with, with joy, Lord. May the Lord fulfill all of our petitions. And may the King... May you, our King, answer us in the day we call. So, Father, we pray that you would bring this pandemic quickly to an end. That's our request. But again, deeper and more important than that request, again, is simply Jesus' garden prayer. Not our will, Lord, but your will be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's our one fervent prayer, Lord, that your counsel would be fulfilled, your purpose fulfilled, your will would be done. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining me. It's really nice to have you. I hope it's still working. I got a phone call just right now. We heard it from downstairs. Most, most of the phones are turned off, but I hope it recorded well and you were able to follow through all the way through. Let's close with a blessing. It's a short one from 1 Timothy 1.17. Now to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I'll be back tomorrow at noon with Psalm 21, a sister psalm to this psalm. Hope to see you then.